But yeah, I'm going to be talking about what computer science looks like in college. Is there anyone here who's doing computer science right now? Like in computer science class? Two people? Oh, there's a couple more. Is anyone here doing like pre-med right now? Does anyone here know they want to be a doctor? No. All right, Chris, you, you've impacted <laughs> single digit amount of people. All right. So computer science is definitely the most popular. Yay. OK, so I'm going to be talking about that and what it looks like in college. So when you get to college, there are a couple, there are really two different tracks you can go down for computer science too. So in high school, you guys are probably learning Java, AP computer science. You guys are writing some, some algorithms, sorting, all that stuff. In computer science, it gets a lot more. It, it'll get complicated really, really fast. So there's two different tracks you can take. So computer science after high school. So there's two different tracks you can take. There's a theoretical track, and there's an industry track. So I'm going to be talking about them both and why I decided to choose the industry track. I'm not theoretical, even though, yeah. We'll talk about theoretical first. So theoretical CS, I have a lot here. You don't really need to read any of that. But theoretical computer scientists spend a lot of time tackling unsolved problems. So just like there are many unsolved problems in math, like the collapse conjecture, theoretical computer scientists try to solve problems in CS. So here, right here, there are just some of these problems. If you can solve any one of these problems, you'll get a lot of money. And you'll get an instant PhD, instant. Like if you're like 12, you solve this problem, instant PhD, it's crazy. So if you guys know how to solve any of these, that would be very useful. You can email them to me. Um, but yeah. So one famous problem that was solved, this is posed by Alan Turing. Do any of you know who Alan Turing is? Alan Turing, he's a very famous guy. We have the same name. Um, he, helped, he helped decode German, German encrypted messages during World War II. And he is known as the father of the computer because he invented the computer. He invented this thing right here. So he posed the most famous question called the halting problem. And what the halting problem says is, OK, what the halting problem says is, if I am a, if I am a machine and you give me a function, can I tell if it'll halt? Can I tell if it'll stop? So on this next slide, I have two different functions. And I have a small exercise for you. Which one of these will loop forever? One of them loops forever. Which one loops forever? Does anyone here know? This is uh, Python. So if you guys have not seen it. Um, I think the first one, the first one still loops. This one. Why do you think this one loops? Because there's a while to x equals x plus 1, and x is equivalent to, and x is equal to 0. Yeah. So x is just going to keep plusing 1. It's never going to stop. So if you guys have not seen CS before, just know that, yeah, this is, this is not going to stop. Um, so yeah, this one, however, does stop. So the halting problem should be an algorithm that if I give it this, it's going to say, yeah, this is never going to stop. But if I give it this, it's going to say, it's going to stop. So the halting problem is, can I make some function that given some other function, I can tell if it stops or not? So this problem is actually impossible to solve. There is no such function that exists where if I give it another function, it can tell you if it stops or it doesn't stop. And this is the most famous computer science problem, the halting problem. So the halting problem is provably unsolvable. You can prove that this cannot be solved. But like, what's the point of like, finding out problems that are provably unsolvable? Well, if we can map out which problems are provably unsolvable, we can find out which problems are provably solvable. So here's another question, the sorting problem. So if you guys have done CS before, this is probably a problem you guys have seen before. If I have a list right here, like 4, 3, 2, 1, I want to be able to sort it. I want to return a sorted permutation of the elements inside the list. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Do any of you who have done CS here, does anyone know how to solve like a sorting problem? Does anyone know a sorting algorithm? Just shout them out, shout them out. Merge sort, merge sort is a good one. Quick sort, Quick sort bubble sort. sort, sort selection sort. 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 Allen sort, yeah, OK. Many, many different sorting algorithms out there exist. There's literally sorting algorithms where I can take every single possible combination. I can rearrange all these elements in as many ways as I can. And I check every single one of them. And I make sure, OK, all right, cool, it's sorted. And then I return that. So this problem is solvable. You guys have definitely, if you go into more high school CS, you're going to see a lot more of these algorithms to solve this sorting problem. This is also one of the most famous solvable questions, uh, the sorting problem. So the sorting problem is provably solvable. So you'll notice that in parentheses I wrote decidable, and this halting problem is undecidable. So what theoretical computer scientists do is they take all of these problems and they map it to either decidable or undecidable, either solvable or unsolvable. 
Um, and obviously, there's like, a, there's like a big line right here. Decidable, undecidable. So obviously, there's going to be like things in between, right? OK, something can be decidable, but it's going to take a long time to solve. Um, for example, the sorting problem I can solve in relatively short time. But an even shorter time is uh, I can solve 1 plus 1 in much shorter time. Right? I just, oh, one, I, like, just one step. I just earn 2. Um, but something that's going to take much longer to solve is if I generate every single possibility of sorting a list, or generate every possibility of list. So that's why I have this like, little number line here. And at the very end, that takes infinite time, infinity time, we have like undecidable problems. And if you kind of think about this, you can kind of see why a halting problem would be undecidable. For example, I could say, all right, if, I, if this program runs for more than 10,000 seconds, 10,000 years, I'm going to stop it. And I'm going to say, OK, it's going to loop forever. But what if the program will actually stop after 10,000 years and one second, and you've just said it's going to loop forever, but it's not going to loop forever? So you can kind of think about that there is no possible algorithm, nothing you can say to determine whether or not code is going to stop. And in the future, like, not every single code is going to look as simple as this. This we can say, like, OK, yeah, this is definitely not going to stop. This is definitely going to stop. But you can never, you'll never be able to tell. So yeah, in the future, it's going to look a lot more complicated. So what theoretical computer scientists do is they take this problem. For example, this is math. This is like a very famous, famous question, too. So write a program that if I give you any math equation, it can say whether it's true or not. So 3 equals 3, obviously, is true. But 4 plus 4 is equal to 7 times 19. Well, obviously, that is false. So if I give it any math equation, any math equation, like, oh, a triangle has three sides. A, a triangle sides equals 3. Anything with an equal sign, I should be able to solve it. Does anyone think this is like decidable or undecidable? Is this solvable or not solvable? I'll give you a hint. It is, yeah, not solvable. Because if this were solvable, mathematicians would not have a job anymore. <laughs> this does all the mathematicians' jobs. So this is also not possible. So math solver problem is undecidable. So theoretical computer scientists spend their entire lives mapping out these types of questions. So if this is something you're into, I do recommend you go into theoretical computer science. When I learned this, I thought it was really, really interesting. Unfortunately, you do not make any money doing this. So um, think twice before going into it. But yeah, if you really, really do enjoy doing stuff like this, um, solving problems, uh, I would recommend you look out, lo look out for theoretical CS. You can always start by looking, oh, by looking at Alan Turing, the stuff he did uh, during World War II with Enigma and decoding German encrypted messages. And yeah, that'll, that'll lead you to theoretical CS track. So theoretical CS oftentimes provides like a baseline for industry, uh, for the industry. All the algorithms you use in the industry were one day they were thought of by theoretical computer scientists. Maybe 40 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, maybe like two days ago. But they were thought of at some point. So in the industry, you use all these algorithms that the theoretical computer scientists think of. So in reality, like you would not have a job if, if not for the theoretical computer scientists. But they don't really get paid. So um, yeah, industry track. So I'm going to be talking about what I did. So last summer, I worked at Amazon. If you guys have heard of Amazon before, you can buy stuff from it. Um, and also, they have this thing. This is called an Alexa, Amazon Alexa. So this is an Echo Dot. This is what I worked on. So my exact, the exact name of my team was the Alexa Notification Service. So Alexas can have notifications. They can like, OK, your package is here. It'll send a notification to your Alexa. That was my team. I was handling notifications for Alexa. So I'll give you like a, a little taste of what I did during my internship at Amazon last summer. This was a 12-week internship. So over 12 weeks, I did this. So yeah, on the left, we have Macy's. I labeled it Macy's. So in case you can tell, it's Macy's. Um, here is my Alexa, and this is me. So Macy's is going to be like, Alan, for the next 24 hours, they're 30% off on jeans. That's such a great deal. So Macy's wants to send this all, send this all to customers so everyone can go like order Macy's. Uh, order Macy's jeans from their Alexa, or they go to the Macy's store, obviously. Some advertisement, right? It's going to put this into a message, and it's going to send it to my Alexa. Well, my Alexa is going to be like, OK, Alan, you have a notification. Do you want to read it? No, I don't want to read it. So after 24 hours, obviously, this notification doesn't matter anymore, right? Since the Macy's sale is over. Remember, the Macy's sale only lasts for 24 hours. So now, if I read it, and I'm like, OK, I want to go buy jeans, I'm going to be very shocked because I'm not going to get 30% off. So I need to find some way to remove it. So while that deal was expired, how do I remove it from Alan's Alexa? 
Alan, you have a notification, da 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 da. See, if I read it right now, it would be expired. I could try to order jeans, but I wouldn't get the discount and I would be very angry. So, what I did over summer was I wrote the code, I wrote an API to remove notifications from an Alexa. For example, if a company were to send out a notification with a typo or a wrong location, wrong time, anything, I could remove it. Another example is like, let's say I, I, I send a notification that your package is out for delivery and it's delivered. Um, and you didn't see the out for delivery message. Well, I want to remove that out for delivery message and I want to replace it with your package has been delivered. So there's many different use cases. This is what I did over summer. So if you guys have an Alexa at home and you find messages are disappearing, notifications are disappearing from your Alexa, that is my code. Amazon is hitting, they're hitting my code. Um, yeah, that is something you got to do in the industry track. This is very, very different from the theoretical track. Um, but yeah, you get to work on a lot, a lot more practical stuff. Um, yeah, you can, you got to work at all these really cool companies, do all the, do all these really cool stuff. This summer, I'm going to be working in New York City doing relatively similar, similar thing, I'm assuming. But yeah. So what's after? What's after computer science in college? So I mentioned you get to choose between two things, really. You get to go to the theoretical side. That's like academia. You can, you can become a professor, um, that stuff. Or you can go to the industry side. You can go to all these different companies. I think if you talk to your parents, they'll probably say you're going to go to the industry side. So I'm going to cover the industry side more. Uh, the reason why you should go to the industry side is because you make, you make money, um, and you don't make any money, theoretical side. But yeah. What are some jobs you can pursue with a CS degree? So jobs is the most important thing. That's why we go to college, right? If you could get a job without going to college, you would not need to go to college. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is academia. This is a theoretical side. So academia can actually be a broad range of things. Um, it can be just some like being a professor. You can be doing research. One research I did over my freshman year summer was I coded a bot for GitHub to detect toxicity. So if someone is leaving like really toxic comments like, oh, this code sucks, like you suck. Uh, my bot should be able to detect that. And that is done through natural language processing. So hopefully the parents know about that one. But yeah, I wrote a bot to use natural language processing. I looked through all these comments. And I'm like, yo, this one's mean. This one's nice. Um, but yeah, that's what I did as a research. And I also conducted my own interviews for that. Uh, it was very fun. So academia can be very fun. I did not get paid for that research. So that was a bit less fun. But yeah, there are some many, there are many signs you can, you might want to be in academia if you really enjoy theoretical computer science, like what I was just doing there. Um, yeah, so like the halting problem, sorting problem, if you enjoy solving problems, you like categorizing them, you like organizing them, you'll like, yeah, you'll like academia. If you find fulfillment in solving extremely hard questions, when I say extremely hard, I don't mean like a brain teaser or like AMC questions, you know? Um, these questions can take years to solve. It can take years to prove like a problem is undecidable. It can take... Like, there's many, many questions, like, on, on that first side. I won't go all the way back. But there are many questions that we don't even know if it's decidable or not. We don't even know if a solution exists. But people are still out there looking. They're trying different things, trying different algorithms to try to find solutions. And you're going to sit there, like, and just look for the solutions as your job. So, I mean, if you're into that, um, yeah. But if you do find a solution, you will make a lot of money. Yeah, if you can connect well with your professors and you love doing research with them. One, actually, I will talk about this really, really, um, really quickly. The most important part about like, your time at a college is the connections you make there. So most importantly, I think, is a connection with your peers, your friends there. Your friends are all going to go to different places, different companies. Like he's going to Stanford, right? Like your friends are all going to go to vastly different places. And the more friends you have in more different places, the better off you will be. The more people you can reach out to uh, if you're stuck, and the more people you can help if they're stuck, et cetera, et cetera. But like, professors are also incredibly important. So if you go to a school like, Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon is a very theoretical school. So everyone at Carnegie Mellon, they're like the front of their theoretical like, computer science field. My professor this last semester is the father of distributed systems. He's been doing distributed systems for 40 years. That is like a long time. 40 years is a long time. Um, so professors at these schools, they're going to be at the top of their field. And your job is to be friends with them, you know, have good relations with them. If you go to a big school like UC Berkeley, it's going to be a lot harder for you to get one-on-one -on -one time with your professor. But if you go to a smaller school like CMU, we, don't, we, we really don't have any classes over like 100, 200 people. Whereas Berkeley intro to CS classes, thousands of people. And that's a comparison, right? Instead of like thousands of people competing for a 10-minute session with your professor, I can walk into my professor's office anytime, and I can just start talking to them. That is something really nice about going to a smaller school. Berkeley and 
CMU are two completely different schools CS-wise, even though like ranking-wise, they both have really good CS programs. CMU's CS program is really good because of the theoretical side. CMU stresses the theoretical side a lot more, whereas Berkeley will stress, like, it, it'll help people prepare for industry. Many, many companies like Google, Amazon, they hire out of Berkeley. They will like, sit there at the Berkeley graduation, and when you hand your diploma, they'll give you an offer, too. I uh, hope, hope you go to their company. So many companies will just hire out of Berkeley. So there is like, it's a, two completely different CS programs. But yeah, um, FANG is the next job you can, type of, you can get. So I'm going to talk about the industry track now. I like, have laid out a couple of um, different, different job, job categories. And this is just based off of my friends, where they're going, the people I see at CMU. The most popular one is Fang. This is the like, this is the the standard, if that makes sense. Everyone at CMU is trying to get into Fang. Obviously, right now, Fang is not doing that well. But the Fang companies are actually five companies. So the F stands for Facebook, which is now Meta. Um, the A stands for Amazon. Second A stands for Apple. N stands for Netflix, and G stands for Google. So these five companies are like kind of like the backbone. Uh, they're all all five of them are located in Silicon Valley. Um, Fang is very Silicon Valley based, so you guys have probably seen all of these companies. In fact, there's a very good chance your parents worked for one of these companies or have worked for one of these companies. So, yeah, this is probably the most popular option. They pay you a lot of money, um, which is why your parents work there. Um, yeah, Fang is a really big option. Uh, they hire out of CMU as well. So you should go to Fang if you are good working in a team. You're competitive and you're hardworking. Competitive is the big one here. Uh, when I worked at Amazon, I worked at Amazon last summer. I saw that my team has to be very competitive. So in Amazon, for example, you do not get promoted to a manager unless your manager leaves. So if your manager leaves, everyone in your team is going to be fighting to be the next manager. So if you fight hard enough, then you'll be the next manager and you'll be promoted. But otherwise, else you're, you're not going up. So you need to be very competitive. You need to you know, be very hardworking. You need to deliver your projects on time. Um, if you like money and you really, really like money, you can go to Fang because they pay you a lot of money. Um, at Amazon, you're supposed to work like eight hours a day, right? Like nine to five. I think I worked maybe like two or three. Um, but I got paid for eight hours. So, I mean, it was like very good money. Um, if you want to learn really fast, Fang is a good way to go. It's very organized. Um, if you go to these companies, you'll, learn, you'll surely learn a lot. So the next type of company is called unicorn companies. Has anyone here like heard of unicorn companies before? Okay. Wow. Yeah, so Unicorn Company is like a startup, but they're privately like they're a privately held startup company that has reached one billion dollars. Their company is worth a billion dollars. So right here, I've included like three 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 things that you guys probably know. Uh, so ByteDance is the company that made TikTok, OpenAI made ChatGPT, and yeah, Reddit is another startup that is a unicorn. So these are all startups. Uh, these are not like giant tech companies like Amazon, like Facebook, but these are startups, uh, smaller companies. Um, and yeah, they've reached a billion dollars, so they're really, really good to work at. So yeah, unicorn companies, you're definitely going to be working a lot harder than at Fang's, uh, Fang Company. So I have a couple of friends working at TikTok, a couple of friends working at Reddit. Uh, you are going to be working, you're not going to be working two hours a day like I was at Amazon. You're going to be working a lot harder. You're going to have a lot more complicated projects just because there are less people. And so the interns that they do hire, they want to make sure are the most hardworking interns. Um, yeah, your teams are going to be a lot more close. So when my friends interned at TikTok this last summer, they, they found themselves to be very close to their teams. They get dinner together, they go out to the bars together, they spend weekends together. Um, you get really close to their teams, and that, that helps you work a lot harder, work with your teams a lot more. Um, yeah, it's going to be really stressful. The, the teams you work for in the Unicorn companies, they're going to ask you to deliver. Deliver a lot of projects, deliver them, deliver them really fast. Sometimes, like, if you're an intern, you will not even know what to do, um, but you still have to do it. You still have to somehow get it done. So yeah, unicorn companies are very stressful, but it'll be a very good learning experience. The next type of company is startups. Um, this one I know the least about. I only have one friend going to a startup. I would not recommend going to a startup right out the gate, right out from, like out, right after college, uh, just because uh, you will. It's a bit. It's very risky. Startups might not pay you well, um, but yeah, like they're a very big gamble. Imagine if you were like the hundredth employee at Google, you'd be really, really rich. Or you're like the second employee at OpenAI, you would be really, really rich, right? But yeah, if you join a startup at the right time, it can be very beneficial. I would personally not recommend joining a small startup right after college, but I do have some of my friends, they did join startups for causes they really cared about. So one of my friends, he went to Harker. 
Um, he had an offer from Google from many trading companies in New York that paid him a lot of money. But he chose a startup in the Bay Area um, that handled like picking up waste from the Pacific Ocean because he really believes in that. And even though he's getting paid half the salary he would have if he worked in New York, he chose to do this startup. Um, and there's 50 employees. Um, yeah, so if you really, if you really enjoy like the cause of the startup, then I would recommend, yeah, go for it. But yeah. Last thing I want to talk about is fintech and trading. So this is by far the, like, this is like what everyone in CMU wants to go to. So we recently graduated around uh, a bit over 90, like 90, 94, 95 seniors from CS. And the vast majority are going to fintech or trading. So fintech or trading, these are the companies in New York, and they just trade stocks. Uh, they can trade a lot more things other than stocks, but stocks is probably what you guys have heard of. So like all of these guys, they do whatever it takes to make as much money as possible. And like trading, if you work in trading or you work in fintech, fintech is finance technology. Um, you're going to make a lot of money. You're going to make way more than if you worked at Amazon or Meta or Google. Um, it's not the most ethical job because you just take money from, from poor people. Um, you just like, you're like, oh, buy this stock. It's going to go up. Buy it, buy it. And then they buy it and then you, it drops. And you're like, oh, bye bye. And then, yeah. Uh, not the most ethical job, but you make a lot of money. So most people in CMU do end up going to fintech, um, fintech or trading. And fintech is not just trading companies. You don't just trade. Uh, for example, payment, uh, which you guys are, if you guys use like Venmo or Stripe, that's also fintech companies. And they pay you a lot of money. So yeah, these companies are by far the hardest to get into. Um, you should go if you're really good at working under pressure. You really, really like money. Like I'll show you, I'll show you like the paychecks later, uh, right after this, which is why I wanted to use my computer. Um, you're never gonna have time to spend your money though. So I'm gonna tell you as a, oh, I'm gonna tell you guys a quick story. So I have one friend, his name is Ken. He's from Indonesia. If you guys have met Nick, if you guys know Nikki from 88 Rising, he went to school with her. Um, but then yeah, he like, he's working at this company called Point72 in New York. Um, he doesn't even do trading there. He does another job. He's an analyst there. But he started as, with a class of 20 people. In those 20 people, there are 18 of them. They're from China. Really, really good, really fast at math. There's this girl from Finland who runs a half marathon every morning at 5 a.m. And then there's him. So like, you're supposed to work eight hours, right? But at the very end, only, like, I don't remember the exact number. Maybe 14 out of those 20 are going to be hired after the end of the one-year training program. So you need to compete against everyone else there. And if you want to compete, well, you can't just work eight hours a day. So when I went to visit Ken in New York this last like, Thanksgiving break, well, he had to go to the office at 3 p.m. on a Saturday to just study and catch up. And it became so bad to the point where eight months in, uh, he passed out. He just fainted from exhaustion in the office. Um, after that, he had a little wake-up call. Um, he, is an, he transferred to a different company. Or he's at the same company, but a different branch, doing a different role. He is, it's a lot more chill now. But yeah, this is like a very high-stress job. Um, you're going to make a lot of money, but you'll never have time to spend the money. So, I mean, yeah. Um, traders must be incredibly fast at math. Most, like, being good at math is one thing, but fast is, fast is most important. Uh, if you can do math really fast, simple math very fast, it's much better than doing very complicated math very slow. So, and very correctly. So, yeah, make sure you can do math very fast. Traders need to be very fast. So, yeah, I mentioned that most people in CMU are trying to go for these. We don't actually send a lot of people to trading companies. But in my year, we are sending 13 people to one company called Jane Street. This is like the most popular trading company. So 13 out of 90 people are going to just one trading company. And there are way more than just like one trading company. So we do send a lot of people to trading each year. So yeah, these, are, these four are really the type of jobs people go for. People I see like in CMU go for who have a CS degree. And yeah, I prepared some FAQs that I wanted to make sure I answered just in case they weren't asked during the panel. But if we're doing OK on time, OK. All right, I'll do the FAQs really, really fast. Um, first FAQ is how important is the school you go to? So if I go to Stanford, does that mean I'm going to get a good job? Like, no, it does not. Um, and if I go to like uh, De Anza, it doesn't mean I'm gonna get, like, not going to get a good job. But sadly enough, it matters a lot. So, oh, sorry, I have like two parts. But yeah, many, many different companies will look at the name on your resume and they will reject you off of that. Like if they see, okay, De Anza, oh, reject. 
or they see like Stanford, they're going to accept you, right? That, that is like the first step in screening. Um, and the reason why, this like, seems very unfair, right? Because like me from, the, like the difference between me and a Dianza person, we probably have the same knowledge. Like we can both sort a list just as well. Um, we have the same knowledge. But the school itself is the biggest filter. The fact that this guy is going to Harvard, that Harvard accepted them, that must mean they have a great work ethic. That must mean they have a great time management, et cetera, et cetera. But if a person goes to a community college, they can't say anything because community college, you can just go. So would they rather take a gamble on the guy in the community college or would they rather take the Harvard graduate? Right. So trading companies, for example, is where your school matters the most. Mo majority of trading companies recruit directly out of Ivy Leagues and only out of Ivy Leagues. If your resume does not say like Harvard or MIT, you're going to get rejected. Five Rings as a company, they hire exclusively out of MIT. If you're not MIT, you're not getting in. You're not getting an interview. Um, and yeah, unicorns and startups are similar. They don't, have a, they don't have a lot of time to interview everyone, so why waste time interviewing people who, they, who might not be qualified? Um, fang companies are the most forgiving. So when I intern at Amazon, Lots of my friends are not from top colleges. There are people there from like University of Alabama uh, that turned out to be really good at their jobs. They're like just as smart as me. We're like we hang out, we talk still, you know. Just because you go to a different college does not mean you can't get a job. Um, so yeah, uh, even if you don't go to a CS college, so then companies will still hire you if you can, you know, pass the interview. Um, so yeah, don't worry too much about the college you go to. But yeah, I it is it is a lot more important than than you think. And college really only impacts the first company you go to. So after I work at my first company, the next company I work for, if I want to like go to a new company, the, mo the thing that matters the most is that first company I worked for. So college really only impacts the first company you work for. So college helps you get a good first step. So you're spending four years and like 200K just to get a good first step into your first company. But yeah, you'll make the 200K back. Yeah, the last FAQ, I, will, I touched on this a bit earlier, is like, what is the difference between CS programs? So you'll see like a lot of rankings say like, okay, this CS program is the best. Stanford is the best CS program. CMU is the best. But like, how can there be like multiple best CS programs, right? Each CS program is completely unique. The culture there is completely different. So I mentioned CMU is like, has a lot more, is a lot more theoretical. Um, like theor the theory at CMU is a lot towards types, is a lot towards logic. Um, so we have one, like some of the best logicians in all of theoretical computer science at CMU. Um, Stanford also has really good theoretical computer science, but they have a lot more systems, systems um, people in theoretical computer science. Uh, Berkeley, uh, some of the UCs, uh, like they all are really good at preparing people for industry. They will let you know like, okay, what do these companies want? Uh, how, do I teach it to, how do I teach it to these students? Like, they'll give you code and they're like, okay, what's the runtime of this? How long does it take to run? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So each CS program is very different. There's going to be, like, like, when you do apply, you want to make sure you do as much research as possible. Even though at the end of the day, you're going to leave with relatively the same knowledge. Um, each CS program is different. The people you meet there are going to be different. I'm, I met a lot of, like, different professors that I would not be able to meet if I had chose UC Irvine, for example, or UCLA, or UIUC. So each CS program has different professors. Even though you leave with the same knowledge, the people you meet there are going to be a different. So that is the most important part. Yeah, those are the two FAQ. Oh, sorry. There's one more thing. Last FAQ is how do I get into the best college? So yeah, I did not have a good GPA in high school. My GPA in college isn't that good, which is like, I do want to like stress how hard Chris has worked for like a 3.94 in CMU. I have a 3.6, I think. And I worked really hard. Like, I think I spent like, eight or nine hours a day just studying, and I have a 3.6. But he has a 3.94, so I mean, he's doing something right. My high, my high school GPA was really not good. Uh, when I say like really not good, it was like, yeah, not good. Um, but yeah, getting into a college is not about like doing the best in your class or having like the best accomplishments, right? Uh, like if I win the math, every single math competition, obviously like, yeah, I'm gonna get into MIT. Uh, if I prove that unsolvable, like, unsolvable CS problem, yeah, I'm gonna get into CMU, you know? I'm gonna have a PhD instantly. Um, but unfortunately, unless you can do that, um, that, that will not help you. So you get into a college by being a good storyteller. If you have done all these accomplishments, what matters is that you can communicate that. If I have started this hackathon, it doesn't matter unless I can convince the admissions officer 
that I oh I did this during the hackathon. I did this. I worked so I worked so hard doing this. Um, otherwise, else all you did was start a hackathon. So the most important part is to tell a story. I think when you're at the point of applying, your grades, your accomplishments, that is all already all set. And the thing you can change is the essays that you write, stories that you can tell. So Chris got into all of these really good schools because he can tell very good stories. He was able to relate um, all these stories in his life in his life to characters in anime. Um, so yeah, like One Piece, right? So, so if you can prevent your accomplishments well, you will be able to get into your desired school. The most important part is to be able to present your accomplishments, uh, whether it's through One Piece or through different other stories. But yeah, that's my last slide. So those are three FAQs that I really wanted to get through just in case they weren't asked in the panel. But yeah, I will pass it back off to Brady. Then.